all assembled here to um, listen to Professor uh, Deepesh Chakraborty, who is uh, delivering a lecture in the Frontiers of Science lecture series of the Indian Academy of Sciences. For those of you who may be new um, uh, or, or may not be aware of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian Academy of Sciences was established in 1934 uh, by Sir C.B. Raman and his uh, some of his colleagues. They together formed, formed a group and uh, registered a society um, by the name of Indian um, Academy of Sciences. So it's been its major objective is to promote science, uh, uphold um, uh, scientific temper, uh, and so on. And 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 also um, we have a large number of uh, journal public journals that we publish, which are um, of of uh, in all domains of science and uh, internationally renowned. We also publish a large number of books and so on. So essentially, we uphold science and we stand for the cause of science. Um, this particular lecture series, the Frontiers of Lecture st Series, started about three years ago, and we've had some stellar people uh, deliver talks in this series. Today's speaker is Professor uh, Deepesh Chakraborty, who is from the University of Chicago and is currently the uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence A. Kimpton a Distinguished Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the College. Uh, he is also the faculty director of the University of Chicago's uh, Delhi Center. Um, I think his uh, term is until this uh, end of this year, but uh, I'm not 100% no, sure. Actually, it's been, no, it's been extended, so I go on to okay. the next academic year. Okay, okay. So he, he continues uh, uh, as the faculty director until the next academic year in, um, uh, in the Delhi Center of the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Chakraborty's roots are in Calcutta. He studied at the Presidency College in Physics, obtained a, a degree, BSc degree in Physics, uh, then went on to do a degree in um, uh, from the Indian Institute of Management in Management. Uh, it's called a Postgraduate Diploma in uh, Management. Uh, and then um, uh, moved on to Australia, to the Australian National University, and uh, did a PhD in History. Um, Professor uh, Chakraborty has done lots of things and uh, he has worked on uh, various aspects of global history. I really don't have the time nor the knowledge to explain all of it, but uh, very few scientists or very few academicians would have uh, a book of essays written about uh, their accomplishments during their lifetimes. And Professor Chakraborty is one of those people who has a book of essays that has been published on his work. And this has been edited by three people, Shaurabh Dubey, uh, Sanjay Seth, and Ajay Skaria. Uh, and its uh, title is Deepesh Chakraborty and the Global South, Subaltern Studies, Post-Colonial Perspectives, and the Anthropocene. This was published last year. So uh, you can imagine that he has uh, contributed immensely uh, to various, um, various sub-areas of global history and subaltern studies. Uh, he, his current interests or his contemporary uh, recent interests have been in climate change, uh, the implications of the science of climate change on historical and political thought. Uh, he's actually published uh, recently uh, this year, a few months ago, a book called The Climate of a History of Planetary Age. Um, and and uh, this has been published by the University of Chicago Press. It also has an Indian edition uh, published, uh, from, uh, published by a publisher called Primus in uh, Delhi. And uh, this was published earlier this year, like I said. Uh, he's uh, also working on democracy and political thought in South Asia um, and, uh, uh, and on the cultural history of Muslim Bengali nationalism. So he works on, as you can see, that various areas of culture, of uh, various uh, communities and so on and so forth. He's a prolific writer. He's written several books, uh, both in Bengali and in English. Um, he, he writes uh, books in Bengali as well and on, on various topics. So I, again, just don't want to eat up his time, but uh, he is a prolific writer. He's, uh, for his work on uh, uh, on global history, work on, on uh, contributions to global history, in 2014, he won the Toynbee uh, Foundation Prize. Um, a year before last, he was in Calcutta. The government of West Bengal uh, awarded him the um, Tagore Memorial Prize um, for a book that he has written and for various other things that he has done um, uh, regarding Rubnath Tagore. Um, he has gotten DLIT honoris causa from the University of London in 2010, uh, an honorary doctorate from the University of Antwerp in uh, 2011, 
the ENS in Paris is awarding him uh, a, a doctorate degree, um, uh, an honorary doctorate degree uh, this, uh, this, this October, in coming October. Uh, and he's an honorary fellow of the Australian Academy um, of Humanities, and he was elected uh, to that academy in 2006, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, in which he was elected in 2004. Uh, today, we have assembled to hear um, his views on um, the title of his talk is uh, The Two Cultures Today, the Humanities and the Sciences in the Anthropocene. Uh, so it's really an honor for us that um, an accomplished uh, historian, um, a thinker like Professor Dipesh Chakraborty can be with us today and to deliver the Frontiers of Science, um, a Frontiers of Science lecture uh, of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chakraborty. Uh, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Partho, for the warm uh, introduction, and thank you also for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, it's an honor for me to be addressing uh, colleagues associated with this institution. Uh, so I have to begin by saying that uh, while this is billed as a lecture from the frontiers of science, I'll be really reporting from the frontiers of the humanities and history in particular um, to talk about the two cultures where they meet and where they, where they probably uh, go their own separate ways and why. To begin with a few um, remarks about uh, humanities uh, from contemporary times. You know, now we see a lot of new private universities coming up in, in India and um, we are often approached both as a university and sometimes I'm approached as an individual to discuss with Indian educators the question of liberal arts uh, uh, education in, in India in the private universities on American models and um, and it's and that's one way in which they want to approach the humanities but you know the, the interesting thing about that is that often modern educators think of liberal arts as a skill set, as a set of skills that will equip people to uh, eventually work anywhere in the world uh, for any global uh, institution. Whereas in medieval times uh, in, in Europe, the expression uh, liberal arts or artists liberales uh, was actually, that expression was also often described as uh, as indicative of something that was considered to be a servant for theological studies. Uh, so my talk will be about the European discipline of history and the European university institutions, um, into both of which India was plugged uh, in the 19th century with the setting up of our modern universities. Uh, so if you look at European, European uh, development of the humanities, um, it's clear that humanities, when considered, when looked upon as a skill set, uh, the skill set itself was seen as subservient to more uh, larger questions that theology asked. Uh, and if you go back to the tradition of the humanities, which is still uh, operative today, and people often don't think about it, is that I think the humanities eventually concern themselves with questions and problems that we all face in life, but problems that are not necessarily solvable or have no general solution to them. So you look back on the texts of the humanities, the epics, uh, literature, philosophy, to see how other people have negotiated the problems. So, so there are problems in life that are not solvable, but you, you have to negotiate them problems like uh, coming into your sexuality, uh, aging, facing death, um, being in the op having to work in the context of uh, power relationships, uh, being in the presence of somebody who who behaves with you with the obvious knowledge that they're more powerful than you are and make that visible. These are problems we all encounter. And these are problems for which there's no general solution. 
But what we do when we see a film, when we read a novel, when we read the epics, we find a repertoire of strategies that humans have adopted um, in negotiating, to negotiate these problems. So I think humanities eventually, uh, if you take it away from the highest goal it had set up for itself in the medieval European university, which was to pursue theological questions, and if you secularize it, then I would say that uh, the purpose of humanities is actually to help an educated person uh, develop the art of living uh, as to see life itself as a field of self-cultivation. Uh, though humanities have come to uh, serve other purposes as well, which I'll go on to talk about. But roughly people see uh, European universities going through three phases. One is what they call the medieval phase, when theology is seen as the master discipline. Uh, uh, of the universities, and and that's not surprising when you realize that even words like seminar, uh, these words we use in everyday life in academia, all have connections to the church and uh, to Christian education, and and therefore the other two disciplines that kind of uh, took a second place to theology uh, were uh, 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 jurisprudence, law, and medicine. Now, this changes in the 18th century when um, at least philosophers think, philosophers uh, like Kant or even a little later Hegel think that the, the reigning discipline defining a university would be philosophy. So uh, even the modern German research university, the Humboldtian idea of the university sees philosophy as the primary discipline which kind of contains other disciplines, uh, which is why uh, somebody like Kant or somebody like Hegel would try to read uh, contemporary sciences, uh, which they knew as natural philosophy, uh, and try to master it in order to grasp the totality of human knowledge under some philosophical rubric. And this is what uh, changes in the 19th century and changes quite rigorously uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you read, uh, you, or just take a look at uh, Hegel's uh, notes on natural philosophy, book on natural philosophy, you will see how much he read of contemporary physics and chemistry, uh, simply to bring it under his own philosophical understanding of what he would have regarded as the totality. Um, now, as the sciences pick up steam and become more and more specialized, I mean, it's beginning to happen for many, for some of the I mean, physics, of course, modern physics goes back to the 17th century, but a field like geology, um, fields like biology, which actually uh, depend on European expansion, um, zoology, I mean, these expansive sciences come into their own, they are beginning to come into their own by the end of the uh, 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 18th century. And you begin to see the separation in the case of two disciplines that are roughly same vintage, I mean, uh, geology and economics. And you, you find that they go their own separate ways. It's like the separation between ecology and economics that we've been living out in our lives. Uh, in fact, the word physicist uh, and the word scientist in English are coined by an English reverend uh, around 1840, uh, and he coins the word physicist because he argues that the word physician is already taken by a medical person, and therefore he coins the word physicist. Uh, and in the rise of these words, you can you can see the autonomous life that the sciences begin to live. And history as a discipline begins in again this modern discipline begins at the end of the uh, 18th century, though it comes in to its own really in the early 19th with somebody like Ranka. But Ranka himself was a student of philology. And the 18th century philologians were actually using kind of historical linguistics to correct the reading of classical texts by the Renaissance scholars. 
And it's out of those attempt by 18th century philologists to correct the readings of the Renaissance uh, 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 people of uh, ancient texts uh, that the idea that a historian should actually criticize, critique their sources comes. And, and Ranka, who was a student of philology, eventually develops uh, the modern discipline of history by borrowing some of the tools of modern philology. So as you come to the 19th century, um, a question that was once common to natural philosophy and, and uh, other kinds of philosophies, which was the question about the final cause, you know, what is the purpose of the world? What is the, what is the meaning of this world? Eventually is um, taken up in the discipline of history by uh, people like Hegel who develop uh, ways by which to distinguish uh, human history from natural philosophy. And this works on the idea of freedom. And I'm brutally summarizing things, but there are, it, so eventually the idea evolves that, uh, that history has a purpose. The purpose uh, is the pursuit of freedom. Uh, now, over the century, freedom will become, will eventually come to be defined uh, as two kinds of freedom. One is uh, freedom of uh, human freedom, freedom to be free of oppression by other human beings. Uh, and the second freedom was uh, freedom over nature. So human sovereignty over natural forces. And these two freedoms would underline the, the uh, <clears throat> ideas eventually of progress, uh, development, or even the idea of vikas that we now hear about so much in India. These, <clears throat> these ideas of freedom resonate to the 19th century uh, through the talk about, about emancipation from slavery, uh, John Stuart Mill writing about women's freedom, uh, the Bengali essayist Bonsim Chandra writing an essay on summer or equality, uh, which he later disowned a little bit. Uh, but this idea that uh, that freedom, uh, and of course Karl Marx is an, another thinker of freedom, it, going up to, I would say, Amartya Sen's book, uh, Collection of Essays for Development as, as Freedom. So freedom emerges as this very important category of thought, giving meaning to history, and all this is summarized in a book that comes out first in German and then in English around 1949, I think, by the German philosopher Karl, Karl Lewitt, called Meaning in History. And he argues that <clears throat> as the separation takes place increasingly between uh, natural philosophy, the sciences, and uh, the humanities or disciplines like history, um, people repurpose history by secularizing some Judeo-Christian idea of salvation. So there is the idea that human history is tending towards uh, some return to an Edenic state of things uh, on this earth. And for that, and but the grounds of that are actually laid in the 18th century by people like Kant, who make Rousseau, who make a very uh, important distinction between what they call the animal uh, life of the human being, the anim the beastly part of the human being, uh, the animal self of the human being, and his or her moral self, and the pursuit of freedom is seen as the pursuit of perfection of the moral self. Um, Kant has a very interesting essay from 1786 called A Speculative History 
of the beginning of mankind or something like that, where he actually argues that um, the animal self uh, is, of course, something that humans have, have and shares with other animals. But what distinguishes the human is the moral self. And the div and divine purpose is to uh, allow humans to make errors, like fight wars, enslave people, make errors so that eventually they can work out uh, the pursuit that is best suited to their moral self. So in 20th century, this, uh, in a funny way, science and the development of technology, they go hand in hand with humanities, both kind of in promoting this separation uh, and, and thus deepening it, uh, but also in expanding the human realm. So one of the, so the, I think there are two tendencies in the 20th century um, and they go together and, and, and this, these two things being thought together by this, by the theme of freedom and by the theme, by, by questions that actually, by issues um, that separate the humanities from the sciences. That that working in tandem of these two themes, and as well as their justification by reference to the justification of the gap between them by reference to the idea of freedom, these two modes of, of thinking get into crisis for the humanities scholars in the 21st century. And that's what I'll be uh, talking about. The, so the two things that happened in the 20th century I would describe them as a as, as thus. As one is that there's a huge expansion of the human realm, thanks actually to uh, to capitalism, to technology, to uh, the use of fossil fuel, uh, to uh, imperial development of the global world. Uh, all of those things, uh, the human realm expands unbelievably through the 20th century. So to give you just one example, we humans, so Homo sapiens, let's say, have been around for 300,000 years. It took us almost <laughs> those many years to get to the number 1 billion, which was 1.6 billion, which was around 1900. In 2000, we were 6 billion. So that's almost a four times growth nothing never seen before a lot of it obviously had to do with developments let's say in public health uh, uh, again in imperial trade uh, medicine modern medicine uh, and of course in the 20th century the discovery of antibiotics so there are more humans around and there are more humans who live longer and just to give you some sense of this expansion just to give you quickly to go over some other figures uh, the world, uh, these are all 20th century figures, and the key to expansion, of course, the widespread use of electricity uh, made possible by the energy available from coal and then oil and gas, uh, things we think of as fossil fuel these days. So the world irrigated area uh, expanded 6.8 times. Uh, the world economy increased 15 fold. Energy used increased 13 to 14. Fold. Fresh water use increased ninefold. Irrigated areas increased fivefold. Urban population increased by almost 13 times. Industrial output increased 35 times. World energy use increased 12.5 times. Oil production in, increased 300 times. Water use, fresh water use, increased nine times. Fertilizer use increased 342 times times. World's fish catch increased 65 times. World's organic chemical production increased a thousand times. Car ownership increased 7,750 times. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased by 30 percent. So I'll, I'll come back to these, these figures later. But at the same time, two other things happened. So the, the human population didn't simply expand. There's a 
a geologist at Duke University called Peter Half, who argues that the entire world got, the globe got connected by technologies, all different kinds from today's shipping containers to telephone lines to satellite connections, all different networks we are using to, to communicate. And his argument is that the big change in human history was that without this technological connection, human population would probably crash to 10 or 11 million. So he argues that technology becomes the precondition for biology. Uh, so he calls it the technosphere. So he actually says just as, you know, you can think of the planet as having a lithosphere, a biosphere, an atmosphere, a stratosphere, but you can also imagine a thin film of a technosphere on which we are now absolutely dependent. And the other interesting development in this expansion of the human realm uh, is something that the geologist uh, uh, writing today about the Anthropocene report is that humans have developed a huge geomorphological role. In other words, we reshape the planet by moving Earth around, and we move more Earth around than uh, all the rivers of the planet taken together. So we are one of the most important geomorphological agents on, on, on this planet. So if the human realm expanded uh, at this rate, what also happened was at the same time that the faith on the part of humanists, and I'm talking about historians and philosophers of history, that history, that, his, that the meaning of this realm of expansion of the, of the human, of the expansion of the human realm, that the meaning of it was to be sought in human history and human ideas alone. That in other words, the expansion of the human entanglement with the materiality of the earth could not be explained by referring back to the entanglement. It had to be, it had to do with what distinguished human history from the history of things. And this takes a particular uh, shape, actually, in the in the a person who becomes extremely important for 20th century historical thinking, and I often think of him as the patron saint for historical thinking after the Second World War is the Italian philosopher Benedetto Croce. So Croce actually uh, goes to a conference on historical sciences. Uh, in uh, This was a conference he went to uh, in Heidelberg in 1903, where he heard Thiers, a German economist whose name was Friedrich, Friedrich von Goethel Ottilienfeld. This is at the Seventh Congress of German Historians held in Heidelberg. Goethel Ottilienfeld gave a lecture which was directed against a German historian called Karl Lamprecht. And the lectures were later published in 1904 uh, under the title Die Grenzen der Geschichte, The Boundaries of History in 1904, where this Economist was the first person to emphatically deny the community or even the affinity of the historian with the geologist, because he says that the historian has his objects, has as his object has as his objects events that he study, while the latter, the geologist, studies stratifications. The emphasis on this separation from of geological history from human history or from the history of the thing from human history. Um, gets uh, a renewed force in Proche's writing, and Proche makes a very famous statement uh, towards the end of the second decade of the 20th century, around 2017, I think it says in Italian, it's translated into English in 2019, sorry, 1919, uh, when he famously said, all history is contemporary history. Because all history have to do with with what humans are imagining, thinking presently. And you know, this becomes a mantra of history writing after the Second World War and influences us directly in India 
by uh, um, lectures given, the Trevelyan lectures given by E.H. Carr in England in 1958, which comes out as a book called What is History in the early 1960s, which is still read, which is one of the best selling books on what history is. And, and Croce's maxim that all history is contemporary history uh, becomes the basic assumption that all history students are taught. Uh, and E.H. Carr actually says when you re read a historian's book, the first thing you have to do is to look when the book was published and from where, because that gives you a key to the thinking of the historian. But in between Croce and uh, 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 and E.H. Carr, there's another Oxford philosopher of history called Robin Collingwood, who also was an archaeologist of sorts, archaeology of classical Britain, uh, whose lectures on what is history were posthumously published around 1946. Uh, and he was arguing against uh, the philosophers on the one hand, like there's an Australian philosopher called Samuel Alexander, who in 1936 wrote a fascinating article in a book of essays presented as a fresh shift to uh, Ernest Bacterer. Uh, and that essay was called The Historicity of Things. There was also the uh, philosopher A. N. Whitehead, who was producing his uh, philosophy of nature, where he was saying physics is actually historical. Uh, and there was uh, J.B.S. Haldane, the famous uh, biologist, of course, slightly younger to Collingwood, but Collingwood, I think, had actually uh, read the philosophy of biologist, had read uh, the manuscript of the book for a, for a publisher, because it sort of the reference to it turns up in Collingwood's private papers. Uh, 1951, Haldane writes a book called Everything Has a History. And I remember as a young student being initiated into history, reading that book and, and disagreeing with Haldane, saying, no, no, not everything has a history. And my disagreement was actually founded in Collingwood's disagreement with all these people, where Collingwood began to argue, no, things have chronology. And the particular term that uh, Sam Alexander has used was timefulness. He argued that things have timefulness. And therefore, historians, philosophers should be able to join the same party as scientists. And uh, Collingwood argued, no, I'll grant you chronology. Uh, things have chronology, um, but they don't have history. History is something only humans can have. And why? Because only humans have motivation. Only humans have ideas. Only humans have uh, certain emotions they bring to bear on things and on animals. And therefore, therefore the argument was that there, they, Collingwood was happy to grant that there is a natural history of humans. Uh, so the fact that human beings procreate, they eat, uh, they have biological uh, processes like defecating or physiological processes or urinating, all the, those things were to be studied by biologists or zoologists or physiologists or doctors or whatever. Because the natural aspect, the natural history of human beings for Collingwood was not history. So history was the meaning making activities that humans took, uh, undertook, even with their own bodies. So, so he would argue that if you simply urinated, then that was not history. But if you urinated on a religious text, in order to start a communal riot, then that would be history, uh, because that's a meaning-making activity. And that, and that understanding that, that um, yes, things have chronology, but they don't have history, became uh, deeply set uh, in the understanding of what history was. By the time India became independent, and uh, and history became uh, a dominant subject. So even if you look at, um, let's say, a book like 1857, which is the centenary celebration of the Great Mutiny, uh, written by Surendranath Sen, who was then the director of the National Archives in Delhi. And you will find a letter there from, I think, uh, uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, who was the Minister of Education, um, saying to him, 
now that the British have gone, you can write an objective history about without being partisan uh, about this, this this event called mutiny. But there's no sense that the history of the mutiny has to include the history of rivers or mountains or terrains, except as a background to the human drama. So, so history emerged as this discipline where uh, uh, this where basically the natural world, which was seen sometimes as erupting, uh, as disaster, as causing disasters to human beings, so a volcanic eruption or a tsunami or a landslide. Um, there's, of course, famous debate uh, uh, with, between Voltaire and the dead Leibniz on the, um, the Lisbon earthquake of the 18th century and the meaning of the earthquake. So while, yes, there were the, the, the background sometimes erupted and caused disruption, on the whole, it was the background. It was very slowly changing. Historians didn't have to really pay attention to it because you could take the Himalayas for granted. You could take the Ganges for granted. And then on the shores of the Ganges, the human drama uh, would play out. And, and that drama, as I was telling you, from the end of the, from the 19th century on, had increasingly been coded by the theme of freedom. And as I said, there are two kinds of freedom. So uh, there's a German historian, uh, Jürgen Osterhammel, who's written a very scholarly and erudite book and, and also a an, uh, fascinating book of the 19th century. And he says, look, the 19th century was the century of emancipation in many different senses. But actually, if you come to the 20th century and see what's going on with colonialism, anti-colonialism, you will find that, uh, uh, so I've got about 15 minutes left, you will find that the world is, is being driven from the end of the First World War onwards by words like liberation, so national liberation, which is something that, a phrase that Lenin uses, uh, talking about countries like India, uh, self-determination, which is a word that uh, political theorists use uh, devolution of power, eventually freedom struggle that we use to describe the processes that unfold between the two wars. And, and Hannah Arendt, in an essay that was posthumously published, arguing what was freedom, um, uh, talks it in the 20th century, of course, in the, after the war, that basically freedom in, freedom in the 20th century and two kinds of freedom. One was freedom from fear. And the fear included not only fear of hunger, I'm sorry, not only fear of the white and Europeans, but also fear of dying, fear of dying from predators. Uh, so freedom included the idea that it was the political job of the state to save humans from predators. So one of the interesting things we find around the pandemic uh, the discussion still goes on whether uh, the success of the virus is indicative of a political failure of the state to protect its citizens. So, so freedom takes on these kind of meanings. And there's also the question of freedom from hunger. Uh, you know, when India becomes free, the memory of famines is still so fresh in Nehru's mind that he thinks the first problem he has to face is feeding the population. And this is before artificial fertilizers, of course, before the Green Revolution. And some, and what he decides is looking at other models of development or pursuit of freedom. Uh, uh, what he develops is a model where, which includes the damming of rivers uh, to produce electricity um, and to irrigate uh, uh, canals. And uh, as you know, I mean, our Green Revolution uh, was tremendously dependent on distribution of electricity for, for irrigation. So, so, so basically, freedom from predators, including colonial predators, and freedom from hunger with the two axes of freedom. And one might look at uh, India's attempted at globalization, the Chinese attempted at the full modernization after Mao dies in 1975 uh, as the fulfillment of that promise. In fact, uh, an anti-colonial philosopher uh, come poet, very well-known poet, Amy Césaire from Martinique, uh, in a book called Colonial Discourse, he ends the chapter by saying, look, 
colonialism was like a failed promise. They promised us hospitals, they promised us uh, uh, railways and industries, and they didn't deliver. It's up to us, the anti-colonial modernizers, to fulfill that promise. So one could look at the expansion of the human realm as the pursuit of freedom. Uh, so even though there's separation between natural history and human history, in some ways you might argue that the philosophers of freedom down to Amartya Sen supply the justification for the expansion of human realm. Um, while there is separation intellectually between uh, uh, the social sciences and the, and, the, and the physical sciences. And that then results in not only the expansion of the human realm in terms of population, uh, there are some fascinating figures in terms of consumption, and I'll just quickly read out some figures uh, to you. Um, so, um, the principal reason the German scholars argues that why the, this realm expands is the spread of the middle class consumption patterns around the world. If by middle class we understand people with a household income sufficient to purchase consumer durables, such as refrigerators, washing machines, motorcycles. As recently as the year 2000, about 80% of this global middle class was living in Europe and North America. But by 2015, their share had dropped to about 35% due to the rapid expansion of the middle class in Asia. And by 2030, the Asian middle class is expected to be at least three times larger than that of the Old West and to account for two thirds of the world's total. And there's a Brookings Institution report from 2017. I'm quoting from that report. It says it's only around 1985 that the middle class reached 1 billion people about 150 years after the start of the Industrial Revolution. So to reach the 1 billion of consumers 150 years after the Industrial Revolution, then it took 21 years until 2006 for the middle class to add a second billion. And much of this reflecting the extraordinary growth of China. Third billion was added to the global middle class in nine years. Today we are on pace to add another billion in seven years and a fifth billion in six more years by 2028. So you can see that the human realm in the 20th century not only was expanding and into this century, but it was expanding more and more rapidly, which is why scholars of the Anthropocene, um, working with some historians like John McNeil, an environmental historian, actually created these graphs to explain uh, the problem of the Anthropocene that we haven't quite broached yet but the, to explain the crisis, the climate crisis, let's say, uh, today, and what, uh, what leads to that crisis. So, so this you could read as world history, and you could read as the pursuit of the freedom, the theme of freedom. So the vertical line, which is 1950, shows that all the figures for real GDP, foreign direct investment, population, urban population, uh, fertilizer consumption, water use, uh, Dance, paper production, they all grew exponentially from 1950 onward. These, I mean, if you've seen these uh, graphs already, I'm sorry to repeat them. They're very well known, but I just thought some of you may not have seen them. It also makes my point. So that sort of breaks it down into OECD countries, the BRICS countries, and others. And you will see that a lot of the growth initially is from the post-world reconstruction of the OECD countries and then of course the newly emergent economies uh, come in and if you could resolve these graphs further which I have some other graphs which that do that you will see that they become even sharper the rise steeper from 1970s on once China begins to modernize and India begins to open up uh, and this new Brazil uh, the new emergent economies come up so a historian like Collingwood, if he were alive today, he would look at this and say, or even a Hegel would say, yes, this is the pursuit of freedom. This is what we were meant to be, meant to be doing. But what the climate scientists did was to correlate roughly these graphs to kind of planetary processes, the way that the planet responded to this fast increase of the human realm. So basically, here you see the straight, straight dotted vertical line going through 1950. 
and showing that as human realm expands, the greenhouse gas emission also increases exponentially from about the same. This is the depletion of uh, stratospheric ozone layer, uh, surface temperature, ocean and acidification, which directly has an implication for biodiversity, marine fish capture, capture sheep aquaculture, nitrogen. So, I mean, the, you could increase the number of items on uh, biosphere degradation. Uh, and, and that's when the whole question of freedom, pursuit of freedom, which gave meaning to human history, to, uh, to Vikas, it's not, I wouldn't say it's completely undercut, but it's quite seriously challenged. The question is, do we have to rethink the idea of freedom? And uh, uh, so let me say two things there. One is, of course, that until about, even though the IPCC had been formed in 1988, and uh, people were writing about global warming, scientists for the popular lay audience, historians were not paying any attention to it. And there's a very interesting article by the Harvard historian Charles Meyer called about the 20th century. And if you read his account of the 20th century, it accounts for all the human tragedies of the wars and Nazism and, and uh, uh, but the heroism of the Vietnam War, all, all that. But there's not a word about climate change because you, history was still proceeding on the idea of human freedom, which is what you see in Sen's collection of essays called Development as freedom. But what these people began to argue, earth system scientists, they were also saying, look, in growing so fast and into such a big presence, humans, their technologies, the animals they keep and eat, uh, the demand for protein goes up with the result that the most populous bird on the planet today, 21 billion, uh, is the broiler chicken. That all this has, has an impact not only on the biosphere, but on but on planetary processes. So it's not only uh, killing off species, starting species extinction, but it's also interfering with planetary processes, heating up the world in the process, uh, acidifying the oceans. So they began to argue that not only are we exiting the Holocene into a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene, still debated, still to be except formalized, but they were arguing and this is not debated, that humans with their technologies, with their animals they keep, now form a complex that is acting like a geophysical force. In other words, human beings, this complex is like a thing. So that separation that Collingwood made between the historicity of things and the historicity of humans has broken down. Because humans, this, this entire collective presence of humans with technology is like a thing in the sense that we have the same impact on the planet as an asteroid strike might have, like the kind of asteroid strike that wiped off the dinosaurs. Because we are, is a now we are initiating a sixth great extinction. And for the first time in the history of the planet, initiated by a biological species, or the kind of impact a tsunami might have, or a huge earthquake might have. And therefore, one could argue that this separation between the world of the thing in the world of the human being, on which was uh, predicated the idea of freedom and the pursuit of freedom that kind of ruled the social sciences and the humanities, I would say in the 19th and 20th centuries, has come, come into some kind of crisis. And therefore, there's a new meeting ground being produced between uh, the sciences and uh, the humanities. And there are many scholars who are actually leading the way uh, in discussing how that might be handled. That, uh, so maybe I've, I've just come to the end of my 45 minutes and I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Kaboti. That was just absolutely wonderful. There is a question that I can read out for you. This is from uh, Professor Ashok Vaidya who says, Rabindranath Tagore wrote Bharat Bhashir Bhaber Itihash. What are your views on the history of religions influencing behavior of masses? Has Swami Vivekananda's influence driven India? 
Shami Vivekananda's influence, of course, have, uh, has been very important in many ways. But again, people who read Vivekananda closely uh, don't find him always saying things that are consistent with one another. Um, but overall, um, as you know, he would often say that uh, building up your bodies, playing football uh, is just as important as uh, religious pursuit. And um, he surely was part of this um, comparative and competitive religious studies that evolved. I mean, uh, you know, I'm an admirer of Vivekananda. It's, it's, um, it's actually quite fascinating. Rabindranath wrote a book on cosmology based on his reading of popular sciences called Vishwa Purichai. This is an introduction to the universe uh, when he read James James and others. And it's, it's fascinating to read him because he thinks that uh, there's the ultimate question, which is the meaning question. What's, what is the meaning of uh, stars being born and stars dying? And he thinks the, the scientists can't answer the ultimate question. So the ultimate question has to come back to, he says, what our Sastras talk about, Leela. Uh, so, um, so there's still, in his understanding of the human being, there was still, this becomes very clear in his the lecture he gave in Oxford called uh, The Religion of Man. Tagore assumed that man was special, humans were special, humans were central to the scheme of things, and that humans were the only creatures that could view the whole. Um, I think most of modern philosophies that are coming out in the wake of uh, the crisis of the idea of freedom uh, um, would disagree with that view. Uh, they would probably argue that humans are not special, humans are not central to planetary processes, nor do humans have a view of the entire totality. So, uh, so I think there would be some critical takes on, on those questions. There are a few more questions, uh, so I have to read them out because they are being uh, you know, presented on the chat box. Um, uh, this uh, this next question is from Professor Vidya Nanjandaya, uh, who says, um, were there other modes of thinking about history, distinct from Collingwood's, that viewed humans and things on a common plane? And continues on to say, oh, well, no, let's, let's hear this. That's from Vidya Nanjandaya. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, the, the, the separation of human from the world of animals and other things happened really in the 19th century. I mean, if you, uh, again, I'm talking about the European tradition, if you go back to biblical history, biblical history, of course, has seen that God made all things over seven days, even Buffon's uh, epochs are like divine days, and humans are made on the seventh day. Uh, so it, I think that the separation that, that of, uh, of, Freedom, in other words, that human history is not deterministic. Humans have agency. Uh, humans have morality. Humans will make errors. That begins to become quite clear from Kant's onward, but surely in, in Hegel, and and that is how they eventually create a distinction between natural philosophy and the philosophy of, and, and social philosophy. And some of it goes back. Uh, to 17th century philosopher Vico's, because Vico's argument with Hobbes shared that, that you can only understand what you create. God created nature, but humans create institutions. So that's why state making was up to humans. What kind of government we'll have was up to humans. And we can understand that. Uh, why science can give us a key to uh, the realm of nature that God has made, but we'll never fully understand that in the way that uh, humans understand, and this even this idea of understanding took on a particular humanist um, quality in 19th century discussions where people would often, in the humanities, make a distinction between explaining something and understanding something. And understanding referred to questions of how humans experience something as distinct from, let's say, a causal explanation of why something happened. Which is why Collingwood was very focused on motivation, but but it's totally true, Collingwood was not the only kind of history. I mean, at the same time as Collingwood, there's the Annal School of History in, in France, which are people who are much more interested in the environment and the interaction of humans in the environment. But they, their finest representative, Brodel, uh, assumes that the environment is particular seasons and the seas, the environment is cyclical. 
it, it's low, but it's cyclical, whereas human society changes almost irreversibly. All right, so the next question is from Professor Rene Borges, who says, where does the concept of stewardship over resources fit in in the Anthropocene? Well, there are many, many sources for that. I don't know all the sources, but one source is clearly uh, Christianity, where people, I mean, one of the, the stories that get read over and over again is the story of Genesis and this whole business of who is the, who is the, uh, master of this garden. Are humans the master of this garden or are they in the position of stewards, a gardeners? And this comes up uh, in the encyclical on climate change that the Pope, the current Pope issued in 2015, I think, where he uses the Genesis argument to say that we are stewards, uh, not masters, not the owners of this planet. This also comes up in Islamic discussions. Uh, Fazlur Rahman, who used to teach at the University of Chicago, has a very interesting book on the basic concepts of Quran. And uh, there's a chapter discussing why uh, Allah is regarded as merciful, as, as uh, Rahim. And he says it's because Allah has provisioned the world for us. Uh, but it's still his world. We might use the sciences to find out what his intentions are or how his mind works. But the world doesn't belong to us, it belongs to him. So there's still that notion of stewardship, I would say, even in Fazlur Rahman's interpretation of the Islam, of the Quran. So here is another question by Professor uh, V. Chohan, who says, true, humans have always killed each other. But now, as you have said, the unsolvable problems are so unique that history and philosophy can't address these because it has never happened. That is the physical pressure on the planet due to human activity. Yeah. No, I think I agree with you. And I think that's why people are trying to rethink. So, so the philosophy of freedom as it is given to us can't address it. See, also the other thing was that for a very long time, the idea, even in Indian thought, the idea of human habitations has also always made a distinction between what is wild and what is civilized, so-called. Uh, now, even when we use this word jungle, uh, we think that uh, you know there are people who negotiate the jungle for us, like the Nishad, the hunter who goes and hunts wild animals and, and brings them back and, and sells them. But the assumption always was that civilization was, uh, uh, was based on, was that humans would be free from predators. But see, today, the pressure on the biosystem is such. I mean, first of all, we didn't know until quite late, until the invention of the microscope, that there were these tiny microbial features. So if you go back to philosophies and religious system before that, what humans could see with their eyes, the smallest things were insects. But we could not see bacteria, viruses, you know, the protists and all that sort of stuff. So, so basically, we had two kinds of predators let's say the wild beast the wild animals and uh, and now we have the the, the, the viruses and the, and the and the bacteria we had gotten rid the human development was such that we basically we we, we, we became the dominant uh, species so um, somebody who measured uh, i think the biomass of mammals found out that it's the the biomass of humans and the animals we keep make up 95% of that weight. Only 5% is wild animals like rhinoceros or elephants or uh, chimps. So we had dominated that world. And uh, But what has happened now is the wild animals are losing their habitat at such a fast rate that they're actually coming into human habitat. So on YouTube, you will find many videos showing uh, leopards coming into the outskirts of Bombay you know, Mumbai and other places, you know, of stories about dinosaurs and elephants coming into coming into uh, human habitations. But but we're also cutting back forests at such a rate that the most emerging, the recent emergent infectious diseases in the last 20 years, 75% have been of zoonotic origin, of zoonotic kind. And Anthony Fauci and David Morins actually wrote an article recently saying 
that the cause of pandemics and the fact that we have entered an era of pandemics is the cause is human, is humans, because we are cutting down forests to expand our habitations. And so this, this expansion of the human realm for a long time, almost for 200 years, was celebrated as the pursuit of freedom and emancipation. And that very fundamental theme that informed Marxism, informed liberalism, informed many other views of Indian, of human history, has come into crisis. So it's, it's, a, it's a modern thing of, let's say, 200 years, but it's come into real crisis. Uh, so, I mean, I completely agree with the remarks you made. So we have a few more questions, if you have sure. the uh, energy. Sure. Um, sure. The next question is from Professor Subra Anantakrishnan, who says, select a band teach theory in Indian schools without simply dishing out some subjective history. Uh, in parentheses, interpretations as per the prevalent governments. The question is not absolutely clear to me, but I'll I'll respond to what I understand it to be saying. So, uh, because it is so something that has been tragic about history writing in India uh, is that it not only was about <laughs> this pursuit of freedom, it became a debating club about different ideas of freedom. And what happened in the debating club, the, the debating club soon became uh, warring camps. And there were battles between perspectives. And uh, uh, and I think there's a need to move away from that kind of history writing to the writing of a history that actually takes into account facts about human footprint on the planet, on particular our country. The, so, so I think historians cannot afford to think going forward that the Himalayas or the Ganges are merely a background to the story we tell for the human of the human drama. You know, like if you read a book on Mughal history, they'll say, okay, you know, a war couldn't take place because the river was uh, so much um, so full in that sense that they had to wait for because the monsoon was on, they had to wait for winter for the river to dry up a little and they could ford it. So there it, it's all in the background. But now the crisis of the Himalayas, the crisis of uh, river systems, the fact that Himalayan rivers service a huge number of countries from Pakistan to Vietnam, but there's no common history of the Himalayas. The Himalayas, you know, the glaciers, the rivers are treated as national property. There's not even an argument. So I think we need to, we need to write histories that tell human beings about the crisis which falls on us in different ways, differentially, but which is still a shared one. And in that sense, moving away from warring, completely warring perspectives would not be a bad thing. If Now that's, I'm answering a question uh, that I understood in a particular way, so I may not have understood the question then. Uh, the person who asked about the stewardship question also has another question, Rene Bortis. Um, haven't wars that govern history also been a result of resource depletion? Yes, sure. I mean, I mean, sometimes resources have a lot to do with history. But see, the, the very word resource may be problematic. I mean, the very word resource may come from a way of thinking where I think that the world exists as a collection of resources. You know, when the British came to India, they published a whole series of books around on the, uh, in the early 19th <coughs> century by a man called Watt who edited them and then they called Economic Resources of India and forests and mines and everything was listed there as resources. But the word resource itself may be problematic in that uh, it kind of, it sort of uh, speaks of a way of thinking whereby you think the world is a standing reserve that I can only draw down. But we might, we might have to change that way of thinking, which allows us to think of the world as just resource to be exploited. But, but on the other hand, I agree uh, with you. I mean, look, there are, all, what, there are already water wars. Uh, a lot of uh, the recent wars and disturbances in, in Africa have been uh, explained by, by, crisis, by supply crisis of certain elements, like wheat or water. So Professor Animesh Roy has a question. Implicit in the concept of a crisis in thinking of maintaining, maximizing 
uh, human quality of life as a pursuit of civilization is that environmental degradation is catastrophic. Uh, but perhaps the technology can rise to the challenge in decelerating the degradation rate. Note that in the graphs, methane emission has already plateaued. Well, look, I mean, we are, a, as, I, as Peter Heff argues, we are a technology based civilization. We can't do without technology. And I think whatever solution we go for, technology will be part of the solution. There's no question. But the question is whether uh, the, the philosophical debate that's going on, and it's kind of embodied, it's for me, it's kind of illustrated by two books. Uh, but the, the point of the debate is whether the human realm should contract. In other words, should we not cut down forests uh, as much as we are, for instance, or whether the human control of the earth or the land control should expand? And and the two books by two Harvard uh, scholars are fascinating in this regard. One is a book on ge geoengineering by David Keith, who is a physicist at Harvard and who actually has a project on geoengineering, funded in part by the Gates Foundation, and who has a book. Trending geoengineering, uh, basically the sp spreading of aerosol sulfates in the stratosphere. And his argument is that since there is no nature that is now not designed by humans, we should only in increase our control of nature uh, to make sure that the planet remains livable, uh, whatever. As opposed to that, there is a book by the Harvard biologist. Uh, <coughs> famous biologist Edward Wilson, who has a book called Half Earth, where he's arguing notionally that half the surface of the planet, land surface, should be left untouched uh, for other species. Now, a practical proposition he has uh, is that um, we should, the 140 or however many national parks exist in the world, should be restored to their pristine uh, ecological condition by which he means to be restored back to the condition that they were in before human beings took out a capstone species which could have been a plant or an animal uh, and that's his argument and the argument so there's an argument about biodiversity and how much we need it so uh, the climate crisis has two sides one is the warming question and uh, whether we can control the warming which is what IPCC emphasizes but there's also the extinction question the impact that our expansion has on other species. Um, and I, do, I don't think it's an easy crisis to solve. Technology will have to play a part because as human beings come into more prosperity, the demand for protein, the demand for nutrition will naturally go up. Uh, so it's a question of how do you manage the remaining, you know, the themes of freedom, rights, however you think about it, egalitarianism, equality, with a kind of economy and institutions that do not at the same time cause a crisis of biodiversity, uh, whether by warming the temperature, whether by simply making uh, other species lose their habitat. And it's why very clear that when in the human realm expands, we lose the fundamental proposition of civilization. Because if civilization is based on being able to keep predators out, one could argue that we are inviting the <coughs> microbial predators in. And that's the point that Anthony Fauci and David Morins are making. So, um, you know, I read somewhere that if we lose 25% of the existing forest cover, we're in trouble. And the figure given in that article in Nature or somewhere is that we are up to 17% at the moment. So, uh, the next question is from Professor Gita Dharampal, uh, who says, could you integrate your ideas uh, elaborated in provincialism provincializing Europe in the talk on the two cultures of today? Uh, you know, I was giving a talk uh, at the new school a couple of months ago, and I was being introduced by an environmental philosopher called uh, Jay Bernstein, and who kind of gave me, who pointed to the link between my work now and the work on provincializing Europe by saying that Tipesh was provincializing Europe before, and He's now provincializing the human. So I thought that was a nice way. Uh, in other words, I'm, I am thinking of a form of human existence where humans exist 
knowing what their limits are. Uh, but it doesn't mean giving up on technology. And as I said, I mean, technology is essential to the civilization. Without technology, we'll have a civilizational collapse, and we're all trying to avoid a civilizational collapse. Right. So, uh, just for your information, uh, Nipirda, uh, Ita actually gave a very fine lecture a few weeks ago uh, in the series, in the series of the Academy called the Gandhi and Frontiers of Science series. So, that we have another series and she gave a fine talk in that. Uh, so, the next question is from uh, Subra Anantakrishnan, who asked a question earlier as well. How can we teach history properly and not dished out by local books that are colored by prevalent so political views? <laughs> I don't have an easy answer to this question because history gets so caught up in local views, in local disputes. And I'll just tell you a story which I hope will uh, uh, show you the predicament. A friend of mine who is from Banaras uh, got very upset in the 1990s after you know the Babri Masjid has been destroyed and there was debates about Hindu history and left wing history and all that. So she called. And she's a professor of history. She called a meeting of students and their parents to explain what was at stake in debates between JNU historians and against JNU historians and all that. And after she had spoken for an hour or so, she asked them for their views. And, the, and people said, we don't mind what you teach us and what you write in textbooks, so long as the questions in the exams are not out of syllabus. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're teaching within an ecosystem of a certain institutional ecosystem, right? Where passing exam, getting degree, there are other pressures on that system. So, uh, you, while you ask a very important and profound question, uh, I, there's no easy answer to it. Okay, the next question is human pursuit of freedom has resulted in degradation of the planet as you explained. Are these are there instances where such pursuit of freedom has had an impact on the visibility of the uh, on the viability of the human race? Absolutely. Uh, the best example of that is educating women and empowering women. So it's from all the demographic studies, it's clear. And Sen was one of the first persons to his credit to highlight it. Uh, and the Kerala model was thanked for it, that when you empower women and when you educate women, they have fewer kids because they have more say on uh, reproduction. And so you have to give them more reproductive rights. And, uh, and because going back, I mean, the human population will stabilize, but because I think eventually the population will have to be lower, smaller than where it stabilizes. I think the, the, uh, in a manner of speaking, I would say, in the half in jest, that the female pelvis has taken on a planetary role, <laughs> significance. Uh, you know, so, but this is one case where actually the pursuit of freedom and the pursuit of planetary well-being go very well together. Okay, the last two questions. Uh, the next yeah. question is from Pradeep Majumdar, who says, extraordinarily rapid growth of technology has ensured that we have competed with the goals of old by creating better and better tools. In the not too distant future, we might create superhumans who will outstrip the ancient go gods, not in ancient gods, not in their tools, but in their bodily and mental faculties. I'm quoting from Homo Deus. Oh, I see that's that's in quote unquote. Um, yeah. How do you see that's that? Uh, yeah, right. That's how it is. Uh, that's how it is. No, uh, I mean, look. Look, if, if there's no problem with the calendar of climate crisis, if there wasn't a climate crisis, uh, then all these arguments that not just Hariri, Steve Pinker makes about human beings constantly improving themselves, and even some people are arguing that we will become immortal, that we'll overcome them. Right? I don't dispute them. But you know, what I would underline in your statement, or Hariri's statement, is the word might. Uh, when the Paris climate deal was signed, it was signed because a certain assumption was made and put into the footnotes. 
the assumption was made that that if the countries uh, stuck to what they called nationally determined contributions to lowering emissions, even if they stuck to the schedule, they would still need technology to develop to a point where sucking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequestering it somewhere would be feasible by a certain time, I think 2070 or whatever the year was. So they made a so a kind of certain kind of technological gamble underwrote the climate bill because we presently don't have the technology. So there's something that will get there. And now, of course, with the most recent IPCC report, they're saying, look, these are non-linear processes. The changing hap is happening faster than we thought. So the question is, how long will it take for technology to get there? Do we will the climate crisis give us that time? And given that you are dealing with non-linear processes, where tipping points are both kind of stochastic and chaotic, and haven't been modeled for, uh, I would only underline the word "might" that you used, uh, or that Harry used in that sentence. And the last question, um, this is from Professor Ashok Vaidya again. Uh, someone asked Gandhiji, what do you think of Western civilization? Gandhiji replied, it's a good idea. Your comments? I think Gandhiji was brilliant. <laughs> it's a great, it, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's a story, of course, that circulates and I, uh, and uh, I quote it sometimes to my students and to others. Gandhi is a very interesting thinker in the present context. Because, you know, and uh, I can't go into details of it because I have to explore more and understand this. So one of the values of modernity has been valuing human life. If you speak to economists, they'll always say, how will you feed so many people? Uh, that's a given absolute value. Every human life is equally valuable. And when I read Gandhi, something I notice in Gandhi is that he has a practice where he absolutely cares for the dying. He administers all kinds of things so that they die comfortably. Somewhat like in the spirit of Franciscans, like Mother Teresa. But he doesn't try to extend their lives. There was a case in one of his ashrams after he's come back to India where uh, there was kind of um, smallpox infection spreading, you might remember the story. And Gandhi was against vaccination, of course. And then a child died. And somebody came to him and said, you know, a child has died, won't you allow vaccination? Then Gandhi thought for a while and said, I think my creator is testing my resolve by creating this crisis. He was one person who amazingly did not subscribe to the modern value that every human life is absolutely valuable, or that human life is absolutely valuable. I mean, you remember his his advice to the Jews when they were faced with the Holocaust. Uh, now, I haven't thought through this, but it interests me because of the way that uh, Western civilization and our civilization has increasingly been about not just putting, keeping the predators at bay, but also keeping death at bay and looking on death as some kind of an enemy of humanity and the dreams of immortality, all of those things which I personally don't have and share. Uh, and I think that's where I would like to go back to Gandhiji and think more to some of his examples. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should uh, stop. And that was indeed the last question. We don't have any other questions on the chat box. So um, this was a splendid evening. Thank you, Professor Chakraborty. This was Thank you. really wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Kind of different kind of a lecture in this particular series, but we really enjoyed your lecture and opened up uh, you know interesting vistas of thinking. Thank you very much. You stay safe and well. You too. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>